marcher. Let's make a start, shall we? Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for um, attending. As I mentioned in the various emails and stuff, this is my first um, webinar. Um, so I'm kind of uh, figuring my way around this kind of software and this process. So I'm, I'll trust you'll forgive me some whatever technical glitches may arrive. Hopefully, there won't be too many of them. I think um, before we start, um, as I was saying to some of the other people earlier, there's no option for um, people to be asking questions by way of the microphone. <clears throat> um, if you do have any questions during the course of the seminar, you can type them in the little kind of instant messaging box, which is down on the bottom left of your screen in a kind of send to everyone. So if you have any, if you have any questions, then please um, type them in there and I'll do my best to um, answer them uh, as we're going along. Um, this webinar is being um, brought to you from the um, Practical Wellbeing Mission Control, which is a, a grand name for our living room uh, here in Blythe in the northeast of England. And um, there is just me and a small dog. The small dog, Sally, is um, asleep on the couch at the moment, and hopefully will remain asleep for the rest of the um, rest of the webinar. However, if um, a postman arrives or someone knocks on the door, there may be some barking and complaining and stuff like that, just to reassure you that that's not me, that's the dog, but hopefully everything will be fairly quiet. Okay, so let's Let's get started. So, as I said, this is inclusive tapping. This is um, a tapping routine, and um, it might be worth saying that. I mean, I've described what the, the webinar is about: inclusive tapping. Saying what this is for, what the problem is, and this inclusive tapping is developed really because some problems are harder to. Um, to take care of than others, or some feelings are harder to shift than others, um, using EFT or using anything else for that matter. And this process and the webinar describing this process is intended to make it a little bit easier uh, for you to tap, use tapping to um, resolve uh, painful and in inverted commas negative feelings. I want to um, just before we start properly reiterate my uh, very small promise that I made in the advertising for this. Um, by the end of this seminar, this webinar, I can guarantee that you probably won't be any richer, thinner, or more popular than when you arrived. Um, but what I can say is that it will probably help you let go of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors you no longer need. I think that I can suggest that this will help in that. Okay, so to expect. Here's the lineup or the menu, if you like. The first uh, part is it's be talking about my way of thinking about feelings. Um, this is just one way of thinking about them and not the way, whatever the way is. So this is my way of thinking about feelings. And then <clears throat> in the second next part of the seminar, it'll be talking a little bit about why trying to get rid of negative feelings uh, can be quite hard work. And in some instances, trying to get rid of the negative might actually be a bad idea. And then we're going to delve into the rather paradoxical idea that um, giving feelings permission to stay can at the same time be giving them permission to change. So kind of letting something be can be a way of letting something go. And then we'll get on to the, the actual tapping routine itself and a little bit of... Um, unpacking um, about the routine itself, how the routine works, how to use it, and then some ways of using this inclusive tapping approach in daily life or in therapeutic situations, depending on uh, how you want to use this. Okay, so if we're going to talk about negative feelings, then I guess um, we have to 
talk about what is a feeling. And uh, this is a photograph of someone having a feeling. Um, I don't know what the feeling is, but it doesn't look like the feeling is um, too much fun. And um, feelings are kind of like the stock in trade of um, EFTers, uh, tappers, and lots of other people, counsellors, therapists. Um, anyone who's got a pulse, really, is concerned with feelings. And everyone talks about them. Everyone talks about good feelings or bad feelings or positive feelings or negative feelings. Um, what we should feel, um, what we shouldn't feel, how we should feel things, what feelings mean. There's a kind of um, talked about a lot. And I want to give you a kind of um, kind of definitions or some ideas about what feelings are, at least from my perspective, that orient me towards uh, working with them. So on the simplest level, a feeling is a signal from the system, that's your system, your nervous system, that something needs to be noticed or something needs to be done. Because our system is kind of paying attention to the outside and the inside world. It's kind of one of its purposes is to uh, keep us safe, to kind of protect us and to help us survive. It's kind of evolution has been hard at work, um, training us, training our nervous systems to be able to um, live from one day to the next. And so signals, what needs to be noticed, what, what needs to be approached, like it's, um, if you're hungry, it'd be really nice to approach a a nice chocolate cake and uh, if you're afraid there's a signal it'd be really nice to run away from this scary dog so these kind of signals going on in our nervous system are kind of telling us what needs to be noticed what needs to be done and perhaps your nervous system is uh, letting you know right now what's going on so you listen to this and look at these slides maybe you're feeling impatient or intrigued curious or bored or something else or perhaps somebody's just walked into the room or the phone is ringing and you feel you have to answer it. So our feelings are a kind of radar system and a guidance system. So um, how do they work? Well, the first part of this is something happens. Something happens. Everything is calm going along normally and something happens. Now, it might be that something happens in your outer world. Perhaps um, your boss shouts at you or your partner professes their love for you, or not. A stranger approaches you, the phone rings, the movie starts or ends, or perhaps your mother takes your photo. But something in the outside world happens. Something in the environment changes. Or perhaps something on the inside world, something your thought, you have a thought, or a memory, or an idea, or an inner dialogue, or perhaps you're remembering yesterday's argument or looking forward to a TV program this evening. Or perhaps you're wondering whether the photograph your mother took is going to end up in a webinar somewhere. Stuff's going on on the inside. So whether stuff's going on on the inside or the outside, something happens that leads to a sensation in the body. So that sensation in the body, which is how we first experience feelings, might be a tingling or a tightness or a pain or contraction or a softening, some kind of physical sense of something's different. Or it might be a change in your breathing, a gasp or sigh or laugh. Breathe more quickly or breathe more shallowly. Change in breathing or change in your state, how you feel overall, kind of whether the system, your body feels heavy, tired or light or expansive some kind of sense in state or perhaps a change in perception what you're attending to how you're attending to things your vision narrows or your vision widens your perceptions open up or close down something like that so it's so far so good millions of years of evolution kind of letting you notice what's going on and then bringing it to your attention with sensations in the body. And then the next part of this is that you have this feeling, this sensation in the body, or this kind of change of state. And then part of you is um, deciding whether it likes it or not. 
whether the feeling is positive or negative. So at some level, the feeling is evaluated as agreeable or disagreeable, something to want more of or less of. Uh, and this kind of starts to form it's the beginnings of our attitudes towards our feelings. So if it's a positive feeling, it's kind of, it's an attractive feeling. We kind of want to move away towards it, to enjoy it, to seek it out. The kind of the taste, first taste of the chocolate cake, so delicious, leads on to the next one, want more of that. Or if it's a negative feeling, we don't like it, it's unpleasant or uncomfortable. Then our reaction to it might be an aversion wanting to move away or to get away or a dislike or avoid. So how we are relating to the feeling is starting to be decided. Now there probably are also neutral feelings, but they're not very interesting. They don't, that's just business as usual. They don't um, cause us to move away or towards or to want more of or less of something. So they're kind of not so interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have this kind of evaluation of their positive or negative. And this often happens uh, at a pre-conscious level, really, before we get to this stage, which is where you give the feeling a label. So the feeling might be um, love or hate or anger or sadness or grief, bitterness, disgust, resentment, affection, pleasure. Whatever it is, we kind of give give it a name. And it's really a useful thing to give things names because it lets us talk about how we feel and describe it to other people. So we can talk to other people. We can say, you know, having this feeling, this experience, and we can share our experiences and we can hear what other people say and kind of empathize with them and get a sense of what they're feeling, experiencing. So we can kind of share these, kind of turn these words into stories. On the other hand, the downside of giving things label is that we can start to think about them. Or so we can start to categorize these feelings. Are these feelings good? Or are they bad? Are they helpful or not so helpful? Um, how do we think about them? So we can kind of organize our thoughts about the feelings. And this can lead to the next session, which is that the feeling might be judged. So not only do we have the feeling, which has the sensa sensation in the body, is it positive or negative, given a label, then we can judge it as being a good feeling or the right feeling or the wrong feeling. So, for example, if someone felt anger towards their mother, they might have the reaction of the just, I shouldn't be feeling angry at my mother. You know, she loves me and she looks after me. Being angry at my mother is a bad feeling and I'm a bad person for feeling that way. If she finds out that I'm angry with her, she might reject me. So now there's a whole bunch of stuff added on top. Or perhaps if somebody feels anxiety, they might be thinking, I shouldn't feel this way. I'm pathetic for feeling like this. I'm anxious about my anxiety. What if something else happens? Which is kind of like the basis of panic attacks. I'm weak and I'm ashamed of what I feel. So the feeling in some way is unacceptable. So not only do we have the feeling, we have the judgments about it. And this is one of the places we can get stuck because feeling how we feel can collide with our upbringing and what our upbringing and what our culture thinks is appropriate. So we get into a little bit of a trickiness. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have kind of ideas that positive feelings are good. Because good feelings are good. I mean, good feelings, things that feel good are morally good as well. So good feelings are good. Love, courage, enthusiasm, confidence are good. And bad feelings are bad. Anger, disgust, fear, shame, weakness are bad. So kind of moral equivalence. So if you're kind of feeling good, then you're kind of on the right side and you're kind of on the side of the angels and people are very pleased about that and support him. So if you're feeling bad, sometimes it can be a sense of being feeling almost like morally bad, not letting letting the side down, not being fun to be with. There's an awful lot of judgment of how your feeling shapes up against your standards and the standards um, of the society you're in. 
Okay, so far. Okay. So I'm going to. Um, I was going to say that this was an opinion alert, but I think it's a bit more than an opinion. So I'm going to talk about three um, myths about positive feelings, because there's kind of a lot of, um, particularly in the tapping world um, and other kind of self-help ones, there's kind of a lot of um, positive talk about positive feelings and um, why the positive outlook is um, to be welcomed and enjoyed. I think the kind of the mythology that goes around these but can have um, can create problems um, with the way that we feel. And here's the first one. Myth number one: positive feelings are a natural state. Kind of idea that um, happiness or positive states are a kind of natural feeling for humans. as like the continuous thing. It's kind of our normal resting state is in positive feelings. Um, this is a bit suspicious because if you look around and listen to people, you find out that positive feelings are not very common. But they are common, but they also come. There's a lot of negative stuff around. In fact, um, perhaps one in ten adults may attempt suicide, or one in three may have some psychiatric problem in some stage of life. So it's kind of on the extreme end. But then most people experience loneliness or grief or sadness or disappointment. Human experience is a mixed bag with highs and lows, pleasant feelings and not so pleasant feelings. So the problem with thinking that positive feelings are a natural state, if you believe that, and if you think everyone but you is happy, then you're going to be unhappy about not being happy. So not only do you have whatever negative feelings you've got, you've got a self-judgment about how you're not, um, how you're worse than everyone else, how you're not as good as everyone else. And that kind of leads on to if you feel bad, then there must be something wrong with you. Lots of self-judgment. I failed. I'm weak. I'm pathetic. Other people are happy, doing okay. What's wrong with me? So if you get into this feeling, and certainly lots of my clients have this kind of thing, I failed, I'm weak, I'm pathetic, that kind of stuff. This kind of not living up or being defective also causes them to start to criticize and judge themselves. So you get even more bad feelings. So you get bad feelings about the bad feelings. And then you judge the bad feelings you're having about the bad feelings. And it kind of accelerates and gets in gets worse. OK, the third myth, you must get rid of negative feelings. Um, <clears throat> on the face of it, this seems like a very um, obvious solution, really. To, if you're going to feel happy, you've got to eliminate your negative feelings. Almost like kind of cast them out, put positive feelings in their place. And superficially, it seems like you know if you just get rid of the negative and you know accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, then we'd all be very much happier. But there are some problems with this approach. The first one is that some negative feelings are very useful. You know, so it's kind of like if you step into busy traffic and you look around and you see that there's a 10 ton truck bearing down on you, then fear is an appropriate reaction. It's probably not a good idea to stand there and start tapping, even though I've got this fear. I accept myself now, I feel even I've got this fear and tap, 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 I've got this fear, tap, 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 to get rid of the fear. Because, you know, if you had the time to do that, then you'd be run over by the bus. The fear is a signal that something needs to be done. So in some circumstances, so-called negative feelings are actually um, an intense signal that you need to do something different to get out of the way, leap out of the way of the truck. There's also the challenge of actually getting rid of negative feelings can be quite difficult because as human beings, we are um, prone to negativity. We have what's called a negativity bias to kind of to get us through, to survive through evolution. We've had to pay a lot of attention to danger and to manage our own safety. So we have an inbuilt tendency to um, be drawn to negative feelings. In fact, one uh, neuroscientist um, described that we have, um, for negative feelings, our mind is like Velcro. 
and for positive feelings our mind is like Teflon so we have our kind of own internal um, bias towards the negative which means getting rid of negative feelings or changing them can be a bit of a challenge not that it can't be done and not that it shouldn't be done but it can be a bit of a challenge and finally getting rid of negative feelings life's a mixed bag mixed bag of positive and negative so even good things will have a mix of positive and negative even the kind of um, you know in your relationship with your perfect spouse there may be arguments or disagreements even in your ideal job or dream job there may be difficulties could rain on your holiday so anything any kind of situation or interpersonal thing will be a mix of the good and the bad and even the very good will have some element of the negative in amongst all the positive positive. and also if you want to learn something new if you're stretching yourself learning something new then there's going to be a certain amount of discomfort involved discomfort in wanting to do something different that's what may well be prompting you to do something different most of the most of the self-help books you see people reading self-help books is because there's something not quite right and they want to change it that's a really good reason to want to read self-help books and if you change then you're going to be in a new situation you're going to be outside your comfort zone and so that will have an element of discomfort or negative feelings in them as well so in spite of um, the positive being an inverted commas I'm making air quotes here a good thing it's not 100 percent everything must be positive nothing must be negative I think life is much more balanced than that and if we are um, wedded to the idea that only positive is good enough then a lot of human experience is going to be problematic to us okay that's the end of my um, opinion alert <coughs> here's a summary our feelings are not the problem how we rate relate to our feelings is the problem and here are four different ways of relating to negative feelings the first one the um, lady on the top left uh, is to be afraid of them particularly the feelings very unpleasant or intense it's quite easy to be kind of scared of what you're feeling or scared of being overwhelmed by what you're feeling so to kind of have a fearful reaction of what's going on inside you the next one is the kind of the guy rubbing his brows to be unhappy about them or feel bad about them or it shouldn't be this way so it's kind of like this kind of judgment thing that's going on so we're kind of adding bad feeling to bad feeling which probably doesn't help the next one are the two portly gentlemen struggling it out in the sumo wrestling ring the other one of the other ways is to struggle with them is to kind of to try and get rid of them to try and push them out trying to get rid of them uh, release them from our experience push them away from our experience so we don't have to deal with them and that can be quite a lot of a struggle and the final one is to avoid them is to bury your head in the sand and to hope that it all goes away and these reactions to negative feelings can be problematic in themselves they can add to what's already an uncomfortable thing so that's kind of where I'm coming from um, with feelings are there any if there are any questions about that so far if you want to kind of type them up into the um, into the little book I'm beginning to feel like I've been talking for a long time without pausing for breath so if there are any questions feel free to type them into the little box at the bottom left and I was going to kind of um, carry on because this is kind of <clears throat> the piece about feelings and now we're going to go into the piece about EFT because well I've been picking up negative feelings kind of hard to change difficult to shift there's all these problems and there are ways of dealing with them you can relate to all these picks yes indeed <laughs> so can I <laughs> um, okay so here we go to the next piece so it's kind of enter EFT and tapping so however useful negative feelings are in some circumstances they can be unhelpful in others so a lot of people try a lot of different things to soften the suffering they have around them and 
one of the ways of doing that is to use emotional freedom techniques, EFT, tapping, meridian energy techniques, and the like. So Gary Craig created a process that he used directly for dealing with uh, negative emotions. In fact, the operating slogan, the discovery statement, is all around negative emotions, that all negative emotions are a disruption in the body's energy system. Which of late, I've been wondering kind of like who decides what a negative is, but that's a separate philosophical point. Nevertheless, you can use EFT, emotional freedom techniques, to soften a lot of negative emotions. And it's, it can be very, very effective and very, very quick, surprisingly quick. And it actually has this whole business of accepting negative feelings built into the formula. Now, this is my um, setup statement. It's a little bit different to the kind of the standard Californian, which is even though I have this feeling, have this anger, whatever it is, I deeply and completely accept love and forgive myself. I've kind of shortened it down to this is the one that I use. It's a little bit shorter. Um, I'm not going to run out of breath before I get to the end of it. So the kind of the acceptance of feelings and how we feel is kind of built into the statement to kind of go against that whole the four reactions to negative feelings. So the kind of acceptance is expressed at the beginning. And so in an ideal world, you could just do one round of, you know, even though I feel angry with my mother, or even though I feel sad, or even though I feel grief, you could just do one round of tapping and everything would, the negative feeling would fade away and everything would be fine, but if only it were that easy. So things are a little, not quite as simple as that because, as we've seen, feelings are sensations, plus labels, plus our likes or dislikes about them, plus the judgments around them, plus one other thing, which is resistance to changing them. The resistance to changing them. So I'm going to move on to trying and resistance. So. If you have um, a negative feeling and you're trying to get rid of it, what kind of frequently happens is that the harder you try, uh, the more the negative emotional situation kind of comes back at you. It's kind of like these two guys, these two hefty guys are going to go up against one another and they're going to push hard and the other one is going to push back. So they're going to be pushing and resisting and struggling and expending a huge amount of energy to make very little progress, these kind of sumo wrestlers. And as Carl Jung said a long time ago, said that um, what we resist, what we resist persists. And I've certainly noticed for myself is the more that I am, the more that I and my clients dislike what it is that's going on, the more resistance it is to change. So in sumo wrestling, the kind of sumo wrestling on the outside, the irresistible force collides with the immovable object and the struggle takes place. In inner wrestling, the desire to change or get rid of the feeling meets the resistance to getting rid of the feeling. And oftentimes the conscious mind, that's the guy with a little bow tie, is um, can't figure out what's, why such large amounts of effort are required to make so little movement. So if that's the trying and resistance, what would be a kind of alternative way? So, this, so if we move from one Japanese martial art to another. This is um, Aikido. Aikido is very different to sumo wrestling. In Aikido, the aim is to take the opponent's energy and to, to go with it, to almost kind of blend in with your opponent's energy and use it to good purpose. And the founder of uh, Aikido, Morihei Yoshiba, said that when an opponent comes forward, move in and greet him. If he wants to pull back, send him on his way. So it's kind of like blending in with what the opponent is doing. And using these techniques, a very small person can throw a very large person with considerable ease, with very little effort indeed. So this is a kind of martial version of the statement at the top, the curious paradox is that when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. <clears throat> so if acceptance, or increasing the acceptance helps us change, then the question 
naturally arises is how, because we can't really do Aikido on our feelings. Um, it's not really possible to do that. So one way of doing this is to use something that kind of Bill O'Hanlon calls inclusive therapy. Bill O'Hanlon, who I kind of um, inspired the idea for the inclusive tapping, is a hypnotherapist and a family therapist, um, a student of uh, Milton Erickson, one of the greatest hypnotherapists of all time, and an all-around good guy. Um, and he invented this inclusive tapping as a way of uh, working with people who exhibited an awful lot of resistance to change. And in fact, if I just move it on to here, it's a kind of image of um, the book in question, which I heartily recommend. It's 26 Methods of Respectful Resistance Dissolving Therapy. <clears throat> and I've kind of um, borrowed one of them to kind of adjust for tapping purposes. Um, Bill Handler is a formidable writer of books. I think he must be up into about his 20th or his 30th book by now. Um, excellent books. If you're a therapist of any description, then I kind of highly recommend this book. It's a very, very useful book. I'm actually going to read a piece out of it to um, demonstrate where this idea, the idea of inclusive tapping came from. So if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to read. This is um, an account, a short account of uh, therapy that Bill O'Hanlon did with um, a guy called Abel, who had a severe obsessive compulsive disorder. And um, Abel had been referred to Bill for uh, hypnosis by a friend of his. And since he tried everything else, he um, finally came to the conclusion that he'd, he'd have to go for it and didn't want to do hypnosis, thought it was ridiculous, but he thought, well, I've got, there's nothing nothing else I can do. <clears throat> so the first session, um, Bill tried to do some hypnosis, but Abel was very uncomfortable moving around and tensing his muscles and altogether having a hard time of it. But And wasn't impressed, but he decided to give it another go. And then in the next appointment, Bill attempted another 45 minute hypnosis session. And for about 15 minutes of the trance, Abel was symptom free and continued to be symptom free for about two hours afterwards. So although he thought hypnosis really wouldn't work for him and probably wasn't a good idea, he did think that kind of two hours relief, some possibility. For it. So he went for the third session. And in the third session, Bill began again with hypnosis. So Bill starts off, OK, for this trance, you can keep your eyes open or you can shut them. Abel closed his eyes as he usually did. And as you're sitting there, you may be thinking you are not going to be able to go into trance. You can have that thought. That's okay. You may be thinking that trance is not going to work. You can think that. That's okay. You may be distracted by one of your symptoms, maybe by the tension in your jaw or neck. You may think you're too tense to go into trance, and that's okay. You can be tramp, you can be tense, and you can get still go into trance. And you might relax as the moments go on. But you don't have to relax to go into trance. You may be obsessing. You can just let yourself feel what you feel, think what you think, experience what you're experiencing, not think what you don't think, not experience what you don't experience, not feel what you don't feel, and you can continue to go into trance. At that point, Abel popped his eyes open. Abel said, that's it, do more of that. That's what helped me last time. And Bill said, do you mean more trance? No, 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 I don't think I'm going to go into trance or that hypnosis will work for me. But what you're doing now is exactly what I need. That's what helped me last time. Do more of that. And Bill said, what do you mean? He said, the way you're talking now, that's what's helping me. Because somehow when you talk that way for a brief period of time, I get the sense I can't do anything wrong. It's the only time in my life when I can't do anything wrong, and I long for that sense. So you can skip the hypnosis, but keep saying those kind of things, because that's what I need. And from that, <clears throat> excuse me, he got the idea that what he'd done with, a with Abel was a kind of to validate their inner experience, whatever it was. So to kind of have all their experience invalidated 
to have our experience validated and included was a very powerful intervention. So now he starts does hypnosis by start starts doing hypnosis by saying things like, so you don't have to be relaxed and you can relax. You can listen to or hear everything that I say and you don't have to. You may remember what I say and you may not remember. You don't have to believe anything about this. So he kind of starts by making whatever anybody feels or expresses perfectly valid. This is where he started with this and he came up with this inclusive therapy which has three principles and I'm only interested in the first principle on the first method of inclusive therapy Oops, excuse me. and that is to give the person the permission to and the permission not to experience or be something so by giving the person permission to be one way and permission not to be that way allows both to be possible now for um, safety's sake to say that he's only giving them permission to feel what they feel and experience what they feel. this is not permission to do whatever they want to do or act however they want to act that would have unfortunate consequences but this permission allows someone to be with the way things are but not to have to be with the way things are and that's the one that I chose to kind of model or change into a kind of a tapping style to kind of put this into a kind of a tapping style so here we go <clears throat> this is inclusive tapping so let's say for example I'm going to use the example of um, feeling angry so at first glance it looks like inclusive tapping is pretty much the same as um, any other kind of tapping so I would say go through the setup statement even though I feel angry, I accept myself and how I feel. Tapping on the karate chop point. Even though I feel angry, I accept myself and how I feel. Even though I feel angry, I accept myself and how I feel. And then you tap on alternate points. So the first point, like the eyebrow point, is it's okay to feel angry. And then the next point is <coughs> slightly, I, I don't, and I don't have to feel this way. Then under the eye, it's okay to feel angry. Then under the nose, and I don't have to feel this way, and so on. So alternating between it's okay to feel angry, <clears throat> and I don't have to feel this way. It's okay to feel angry, and I don't have to feel this way. And so on, until you've done one round, and then to check in again, so how's the feelings? Um, typically, this tends to soften uh, soften up feelings quite nicely in, in a, an interesting way for the person doing a tapping and I want to spend a little bit of time because it looks so simple I mean it's just a sentence really isn't it I mean you've been here for 45 minutes to allow me to get to the point where I can tell you a sentence but I want to explain a little bit about what the sentence is about to help you understand how I've intended this to work so it might help you when you come to use it so let's unpack the words a little bit it's okay to feel whatever it is and I don't have to feel this way so the first part it's okay to feel whatever it is or to experience whatever it is is the part about acceptance this is kind of accepting the way things are so just accepting the way things are the next part uh, is the word and an and is for um, equality of things it, quality of the two parts of the sentence actually because when you say and you you're implying that two things are equal so if I say it's okay to feel X and I don't have to feel this way is making those two things of equal importance it's not the same as saying but it's okay to feel X but I don't have to feel this way if any because the word but although some people use that is it negates the first part of the sentence so if somebody said um, tells you that's a great idea um, but this is mine what does that do to your great idea or you feel sad but it will pass the but negates the first part of the sentence so you're kind of downgrading the first part of the sentence so in this case we're using and okay so it's okay to feel angry for example 
and I don't and I don't have to feel this way. It's not the same as saying it's okay to feel angry, but I don't have to feel this way. Because in that one, the, the angry part is put into second position, becomes a second class feeling, and there'll be resistance to that. So the and is an important piece. Okay, the next bit. I don't have to feel this way in this case, or I don't have to think this way, whatever it is. I don't have to um, introduces the possibility that something might be different. So at the same time you're acknowledging that something is bad or feels difficult, you're also acknowledging the possibility that it can be different. But it doesn't say how. It doesn't suggest how it could be different. That's left for the system to come up with something. The system will come up with its own answer to the question, of, well, if I'm not feeling this way, how will I feel? So there's no kind of direction or um, prompting from the therapist or the person using this tapping routine uh, to go in any direction towards or away from anything because the system knows best and that unpacking negative emotions may go in unanticipated directions and you can add you can layer these statements one on top of the other so you could for example start with it's okay to feel angry and I don't have to feel this way do a little bit of tapping and then realize the feelings hurt so then it's okay it's okay to feel hurt and I don't have to feel this way and then the feeling of resentment may arise it's okay to feel resentment and I don't have to feel this way and then perhaps the feeling of sadness it's okay to feel sadness and I don't have to feel this way and so on so each time you're making space for something different or making space for something to change but you don't know what that is and one other final piece is that when you do the it's okay to feel angry the chances are tail enders are going to come up at least unconsciously so it's okay to feel angry you might have a voice in your head going oh no it's not no it's not okay to feel angry at all it's a terrible thing to feel angry. i shouldn't feel angry what would people think if i feel angry and all the other stuff ideas we have about ourselves so it's provoking the tail enders which get tapped out as you're going around so you're working on the tail enders the acceptance of the feeling and then the possibility of moving on to something else all packed into one sentence are there any questions about that, that particular piece so far because i wanted to explain why the words are the way they are so are there any questions for that oh okay i'll move on and get some chance for some questions right at the end so what happens with this well typically stuck feelings and thoughts start to soften and release do you actually, oh I I've got a question do you change each round at each point I change each point so I'm just backtrack a wee bit so it would go let's go right back let's go here so we're tapping on the alternate point so it would be eyebrow it's okay to feel angry side of the eye and I don't have to feel this way under the eye it's okay to feel angry under the nose and I don't have to feel this way chin it's okay to feel angry collarbone and I don't have to feel this way under the arm it's okay to feel angry top of the head and I don't have to feel this way so you're alternating them very closely so those two things are almost seamless okay does that does that clarify that yes back up to here Oops. <clears throat> so typically these kind of feelings can suffer and things Ooh, another question does that lead to and in how many different ways can I feel better that's a paradoxical tapping which funnily enough will probably be featuring in another webinar uh, some other time you can use that um, later on so I would see the inclusive tapping as a way of shifting a stuck state where you go from sh after you've shifted the stuck state um, there are lots of different um, possibilities so it could lead to uh, using choices or it could do um, lead into doing paradoxical tapping so another question if you change angry to hurt etc do I change each point or each round um, 
what happens typically is that if you're doing a round of say, even though I feel, I, you know, I feel angry, it's okay to feel angry and I don't have to feel that way, it's okay to feel angry. So you go through the round then something actually I feel hurt. So then it's a new round alternating, it's okay to feel hurt, but it's okay to feel hurt and I don't have to feel that way. So there tends to be one round per feeling or one or more rounds per feeling. So, let's see, where am I at? So, typically the feelings and thoughts start to soften and release more quickly than if you're just using standard EFT. Once you've got the feelings down or softened or down to um, a copable level, then you can use some of the other things like, for instance, Pat Carrington's choices method, or you could use the paradoxical tapping method, or you could use some other kind of thing to help somebody move forward in some way. What this is for is to relieve the tension or the resistance to the, the actual moving forward. If you try too early or too hard to shift uh, a negative into a positive, then there'll be some kind of resistance or probably be some sort of resistance or pull on that. This is to process all the resistance, all the thing that's keeping the feeling stuck. Once the feeling's unstuck, then you have much more, you know, you have some possibilities for doing some different, some, doing some different things. So just going to go into some variations on a theme. So some of the different variations on a theme are, we start off with the first, it's okay to feel, and I don't have to feel this way. This is the standard, the feeling one. So the next one would be, it's okay to think, and I don't have to think this way. So it could be something like, you know, it's okay to think that I'm rubbish, and I don't have to think this way. It's okay to think that I'm useless, and I don't have to think this way. It's okay to think that I'll never figure this out, and I don't have to think this way. So here you're kind of acknowledging, accepting, respecting the negative, and then introducing the possibility that it could be different. That can be quite helpful with some limiting beliefs, a way of kind of softening up limiting beliefs or limiting ways of thinking about stuff. Okay, here's another um, particular one. It has um, This came about with um, someone who self-harmed and they would have a feeling, kind of, kind of strong feeling, and they'd want to hurt themselves, they want to cut themselves. And it's kind of like the feeling would precede the action. So here you could say something like, it's, even though it's okay to feel like I want to hurt myself, and I don't have to act on this. So you kind of separate the feeling out from the behavior. So it's okay to feel sad and I don't have to act on this. It's okay to feel angry and I don't have to act on this. So if somebody kind of has a feeling that kind of propels them into some sort of action. And I had um, somebody emailed me the other day to say that they'd use this um, for uh, chocolate cravings. They, well, a couple of things actually. Cravings for chocolate and um, they had this thing about playing solitaire, if you're familiar with the PC game solitaire, which is a tremendously popular addictive game actually. And lots of people spend a lot of time on solitaire. Anyway, she had the thing about chocolate and she tapped that uh, it's okay to have this craving for chocolate, but I don't have to eat it. It's okay to have this craving for chocolate and I don't have to eat it. For solitaire, she said it's okay to have this urge to play solitaire and I don't have to do it. And she said at the time of writing the first email that she'd been three days without playing solitaire and about the same time without having more than one piece of chocolate. And then she emailed me a little bit later. So she'd gone for several more days with, I had not played solitaire in the slightest, not at all, playing solitaire and not had any chocolate cravings at all. So I, that was really interesting because I hadn't thought of those um, as ways of using it. And then there's one more, and this comes from the same lady called Maria. So thank you very much for these suggestions, Maria. It's lovely to um, have someone who kind of takes something and run with it. She had this thing about um, uh, doing some chores. And so let's say one of the chores was um, skipping, clean, you know, that she kind of um, wanted to clean the bathroom, but she didn't do it. You know, it's kind of, you have this kind of thing, I don't want to do this, and I can't be bothered. 
So she kind of came up with, um, it's okay to skip, it's okay not to do the chores, and I can do them anyway. It's okay not to clean the bathroom, and I can do it anyway. And the funny thing is that she said, um, actually she did two rounds of time, and she just went and did it. There's no kind of fuss or resistance, and just went ahead and did the chores. Now, I think that's a really interesting idea. So I only have one, um, one person's uh, experience of that. So that's a kind of a new thing I've not really tried out myself. So I'm kind of um, quite keen to um, to try that out. So there's four four different ways of using the same kind of thing. Okay, <sighs> nearly getting close to the end of the hour. So suggestions. Here's my suggestions for trying stuff out. First of all, find a stuck feeling, a thought or a pattern, and just try a few rounds of inclusive tapping to see what happens. If it works, rinse and repeat. That's it, really. For that. Because it's such a simple pattern, it doesn't take too much effort to try out. Um, it's very simple and straightforward. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm going to suggest that as uh, part of your homework, if I can use that word, is to just to try this out with uh, a few things and just to notice what happens. And if you have interesting experiences, then you know please um, drop me a line uh, and let me know how it goes because I'm very keen to add to my um, selection of possibilities. So kind of um, I've talked far more than I thought I was going to. Um, are there any questions about the process? <clears throat> It's always possible if you have questions afterwards to um, drop me a line and uh, I can answer them there. But if you have any questions at the moment wanting to know how something works, then now might be a good time to ask. Now, I can't tell whether anyone's typing or not, so I'm going to wait for a couple of seconds longer. Okay. It'll probably pop up when I start speaking about the next thing. So I'm just going to mention, um, usually at the end of these um, webinars, there's a kind of gratuitous, inevitable sales pitch. So I'm going to make one, an inevitable sales pitch. And that's just to say that this, um, this inclusive tapping thing is written up, along with 11 other tapping techniques, at the EFT collection, which is available as an e-book or as a paperback, which you can find on my website. And in fact, I'm going to give you um, a download link for the slides for this uh, presentation and also um, a write-up of inclusive tapping. So uh, you'll get that um, in an email that follows this. So I guess the end of the inevitable sales pitch. I felt I had to do that to keep in. So here's a list of um, future webinars. This is kind of like 17th of July, which is pencil and paper tapping. So how a pen piece of pen piece of paper and a pencil can help you in your day-to-day -day tapping. 18th of September, exception tapping. 16th of October, uncovering limitations. 20th of November, from a description to a solution. And the 18th of December, what works for me? So I'm not going to describe them too much, basically, because I haven't got too much time. And I dare say you'll be receiving an advert about them um, when they're ready. So finally, it only remains for me to say thank you so much for turning up. Um, this has been a very um, interesting experience for me. As far as I can tell, nothing crashed and you heard me and you saw all the slides. So um, I'm off to say an hour, uh, one hour father and three Hail Marys and um, to thank the spirits for uh, getting me through the technological bits of this. Um, thank you very much. Um, Please try it out. Please let me know how it goes on, and I shall be sending you some email links with the link to the recording of this and some other stuff. So um, I think that probably wraps it up now. So um, thank you very much, and uh, hope to be with you again sometime soon. Okay.